jump into holding uh, the, the index ETFs as core holdings. I don't know when it changed, maybe 2011, 2015. Like when I first started, no one knew what the S&P 500 was. There was no comparison, right? You got your statement once a month and that is it. You have no idea what the market did for that month at all. Nowadays, you're being compared to the S&P 500. So you can educate your client all you want. Evan, I'm different. I'm this, I'm that. That's going to, the education part is going to buy you time, Hmm. right? I'll buy you a few months, maybe a year. But the minute that you start to diverge too much against the S&P 500 in the opposite direction, if the market is up and you're flat or down, Mm -hmm. that education goes out the window. (laughs) And that's the reason why if you manage money for other people, whether you're an advisor, whether you're in a hedge fund, no matter how much you educate someone, right? Even even guys, for example, who are dedicated shorts, Mm -hmm. they're still being compared to the S&P 500. That's crazy. why not own the S and P five hundred, right? Let's say, for example, uh, you you own twenty five to fifty percent of what you have. You put it in the S and P five hundred. So no matter what happens, you're going to have some type of participation because you're going to be judged based on what that did. So that's that's one of the most important things to owning the S and P five hundred. From that perspective, if you're an advisor, you manage money. If you are a client, if you are you know, Joe Small, you know, doing your own thing. By owning the S&P 500 and having a long-term time frame, you are guaranteed to own all the big, longest-term winner in the market ever. You're going to own the Facebook, the Apples, every single one of them. So it's important to own the S&P 500. You're going to own them without company-specific risk, number one. Mm-hmm. And number two, if you look at the stats, I forget who uh, who came out with the study and the stats, that the market gains over the last, whatever it is, 80 to 100 years came from 4% of stocks. <laughs> Those stocks are going to be in the S&P 500. So it's in your best interest to own the S&P 500 as a core holding. You could increase and decrease depending on what's going on with the market. The market goes down 15%. The average intra-year decline for the market in the, in the last, since 1980, is 14%. So when the market goes down 14%, you want to increase your holding into the SPY. Once we get, you know, top heavy, like now, then you can start to decrease, but you always want to buy some on the way down. Um, so that, so, and, and as a trader, as an individual trader, I don't believe in, in a hundred percent cash positions mm-hmm. where I'm going to go in and out and wiggle. I don't believe in that. Right. Um, and there's certain times in the market where you're not in tune with what's going on with the S&P 500. Over the last seven months, market has been chugging higher and most stocks are not doing anything at all. We had little small pockets of opportunities to trade, right? So the market is going up and people who are swing trading, are not they're not gaining any traction. Now, if you own the S&P 500, you're not going to catch FOMO because you own it already. You own a piece of it. You're there. So even if you're not in tune, you have some type of participation while the market is going up. Here at here we have two or three months left. You got a bunch of guys saying, hey, uh, the market is up 20%. I'm down 10. I got to force the issue here. So now you start forcing the issue, trying mm-hmm. to you know gain some traction. If you own the S&P 500, you, you're not going to catch that FOMO. So there's a lot of different important factors to owning those ETFs as core holdings for advisors, uh, swing traders, do it, you know, do it yourself guys, everyone. Yeah. I, I, so I've heard you talk about this and, and I love this mindset, this approach. I think just like you articulated there, it's, uh, it's the foundation, it's the core, right? Like it gives you your foundation of, own, of being involved in the market, you know, getting paid for, for holding stocks. But then, I mean, it's almost like you've taken the 60, 40. I hate, you know, continue to keep bringing right. that up, but you've taken the 60 and you, sure hold the 60% stocks, but you're 40% instead of bonds, you're going to tactically and actively and risk manage that portion. If you look at the numbers, there's a website, I think called portfolio back testing, whatever the case may be. If mm-hmm. you look at the numbers, they're not off by that much. If you held a uh, 20% in the queues, 20 in the spy, 20 in the IWM and 40% cash, versus 100% S&P 500, the numbers are not far off. 
the volatility, the drawdown is like 19% if you were 100% invested to 13%, right? Yeah. And that 40% cash, that doesn't include, again, you you know, the market going down 15% and you're buying more. It doesn't sure. include all that stuff. So even if you did 60 cash, you did well. So let's do 60 S&P, IWM, whatever it is, QQQs, and then the other 40, like you said, tactically. We're yeah. going to try to outperform tactically with the other 40%. Hey, it's Evan here. I hope you enjoyed this clip from our full-length interview. Don't forget, if you want to hear this entire episode with even more insights from our awesome guest, you can find it by searching the Smarter Trading Podcast in iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. You can also find all of the show notes for this episode by heading to thetraderisk.com forward slash podcast. Thanks for tuning in.